All right. Okay, raise your hand if you're a math person. All right, raise your hand if you're not a math person. All right, excellent. All right, good, now I know what we're, we're working with. Hold on to that as we go through my talk. So, okay. Um, um, okay, um, sorry. I am gonna talk today about connecting math to the brain. Okay, so many of you know that we have a, a problem today with math education in the United States. We are, international studies say again and again that we are underachieving in mathematics. We're not doing as well as countries we compare ourselves to. Now I teach teachers how to teach math. That's what I do for a living. And I do not believe that this is a teacher problem. I don't believe that it's a student problem. I don't believe that it's a, a parent problem. I believe what we have, the reason we're underachieving, is a, it's a cultural issue. We have a cultural problem. We see math in the United States uh, as about talent. And when we see math as about talent, that affects our policy. It connects to our policy. We become okay with uh, tracking students from a young age because we're looking for the talented students. Uh, we presume that there's some students who just won't learn math as well. This is problematic. The countries that are outperforming us don't see math as about talent, they see it as about effort. And all students are provided the opportunity to apply their effort to learn math. And the presumption is that they can all do that. I want you to, th the other part of this cultural problem actually is, is how we perceive math in general. So we tend to see math as about procedures. I've gotta get you to memorize these procedures and when you do then you can solve math problems. And this is also problematic because it, it plays into the cycle of this idea that math is about talent because if I am teaching math as about procedures, then what happens is that our good memorizers begin to be perceived as our strong math students. And then we start to perceive that the students who didn't memorize as quickly are slowing those students down. And it's this vicious cycle that separates students out rather than giving all students the kind of authentic math instruction that they deserve. I believe, my idea, is that if we understand how math connects to the brain, we can sort of weed out these cultural assumptions and make policy and instructional changes that, uh, that are connected to how we process math. Because right now in the United States, we're not doing that. So what do I mean? Well, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story and how I came to this belief through some examples. Now I'm gonna start with Tracy. My mom was a, a, a teacher herself, and she had a student we call Tracy. And this is how Tracy did her subtraction problems. And my mom, of course, said, Tracy, talk me through this. What's going on here? And Tracy said, well, <laughs> geez, Ms. Faulkner, that's easy for me. Subtraction's easy, eight. Take away five, you got eight. <laughs> seven, take away four, seven. I mean, what could be simpler? What's fabulous about Tracy, why I love Tracy, and ask yourself the question, is Tracy a math person? What I love about Tracy is that that's a perfectly legitimate paradigm. If you have your steak and you have your potatoes and you eat your steak, you still have your potatoes, okay? <laughs> and that's what she's doing. She's applying a concrete paradigm in, inappropriately to a symbol. Well, why does this happen? And I believe that this is, again, reinforced by our instruction. That's not three. What do I mean by that? Well, is this a cat? The way we teach math is we teach math through digits, through symbols, and we learn to manipulate symbols. But we don't do that in reading, right? We understand that that's not a cat. We have to learn what's underneath the word. Well, we also have to learn what's underneath the symbols in a more systematic way that connects to the brain. That's three, that's three. This is a synonym for three. It doesn't look like three, but it is three. So think about that. We need to not teach digits we need to teach number. What's underneath the number? 
That is our brain on math. We, it is. We have a very unsophisticated processor for math. It's like a crow's processor, a mouse's processor. We process math through fullness. We have what's called an analog math processor, an analog number processor. What does analog mean? It means to measure through fullness. And that's what we do. That's what our brain does when it processes number. We measure through fullness. So what does that look like? If we understand that that's one full, then we can see that double that is two full. We now know that six-month-old babies are already doing this. That's hardwired. Six-month-old babies can tell the difference between two and one. We can still see this. That's three. It's three full, four full, five full. Somewhere after five, it gets murky in our brain. Our analog processor gets overloaded. And when we have a lot of stuff, we have to start counting. But counting's actually pretty inefficient. It's actually more efficient to group. So I'm gonna show you another slide with a bunch of dots. And if you were trying to figure out how many dots that was, you could count, which is relatively inefficient, or you could group. And I know that none of you looked at that and saw 12 immediately. Your brain had to go through stages. It had to clump and say there were three, there were three, there was four, there was two, uh, 12. That's called conceptual subitizing. You're dealing with the fact that your analog processor is pretty limited, so you clumped. This is why we have a base system. So if we can take this you know, infinite amount of number and, cl and clump through a base system, then we can start to make numbers smaller. Okay? Instead of 10 things, we have 110. This is why humans came up with this really cool system, which is all about digits. But we still process through the fullness. Okay? So young students oftentimes see 19 as a bigger number than 21 because they've learned that 9 is a bigger digit. But they don't understand the system and what's underneath the digits. So my argument is we need to connect to the analog brain in order to teach kids math all the time. So Sharon Griffin and Robbie Case have a really cool um, argument for using a circuit number line to teach students the base system when they're young. And so if I play a game, I have a, a skating game that they play, and I've adapted this for older kids, I go through this, and I, you can almost feel it go through your brain how full it is. Now, if I give you a reward card for getting all the way around, you pretty quickly start to understand that that one is different than those other ones. I had to work hard for that one. That's one whole time around. Once I understand what's underneath the digits, it becomes easy for me to know that, hey, that's 19, one whole time around, and then that nine is actually less powerful than the one because I haven't even gotten another way around. So now, as a student, you can see students, I've done this with kids, five through 20. They start to see, oh, 21. That means I've been two times around and one more. So they quickly understand what's underneath the digits. We have this idea that we're in the digital world now, so we don't need analog. Why would I teach kids an analog clock? That's so passe. We're in the 21st century. This is 18th century, 19th century. Well, we teach them the analog because that's how our brain works. That students don't know how to make conversions because we teach them tricks and procedures. But if I understand what's underneath that clock, I can e much more easily convert time because I understand that 60 minutes, I'm keeping track of 60 minutes. So now the digits 101 have more power. That's one hard fought hour, 60 minutes, plus one more. If I teach at the digital level, there's no reason to believe that students are connecting to how their brain actually processes those numbers. So I have to do the analog underneath first. We make the mistake of thinking that I can just get kids to memorize things at the digital level. And it's, it's not working. We, we tend to get into tricks and procedures. Oh, just, you know, I'm teaching you the, the uh, metric system. Well, move it over. If you go from, um, what are meters to centimeters, just move it over to, you know, move the decimal over to without really processing what's underneath. But if I play games with kids and get them to go all the way around and get it, oh, that's a hard-fought 100 centimeters, 
Now I can make conversions because I've got it in my mind. I can convert from millimeters to meters to centimeters because I can picture it because I've, I've been, my brain has been connected to. So what the international research shows us is not just that we're weaker in math, but also that our instruction is so procedural. We think of math as a series of procedures. And again, the good memorizers are praised as good math students. And the, the weak memorizers get held behind. What these countries that are outperforming us do is they make connections. And I argue that essentially these connections across the mathematics are working because they connect to how our brain processes. Now this is, I said, not just a teacher thing, not just a parent thing, not a student thing. This, it's a cultural thing that we all need to deal with because teachers are working hard and trying to make changes. The Common Core Standards are trying to make these connections, but what will oftentimes happen is that parents will give comeback, pushback on them, and say, well, that's not how I learned it. You've got to remember, how we learned it is what got us into this place, okay? So we need to, you want teachers to be teaching it differently. There's also this idea, hey, my student already has their math facts memorized. You're holding my cherub back, okay? Mine's a talented student. Why are you making my student do these long drawing things out when my student already has their math facts memorized? But let me show you how important it is to not just memorize your math facts, but understand what's underneath it. I just want to remind you, uh, we were taught the distributive property pretty much like this. Hey, multiply the 8 times the x and multiply the 8 times the 5, right? But there's something underneath the distributive property. And also, uh, in education, we call this an array. That would be a 3 times 3 array. So let's take a look. Working on my math facts. If I understand that 2 times 8 is 16, great, at the symbolic level. But I also have to understand it underneath. I have to connect to what it means in terms of space so I can connect to my brain. If I understand that 2 times 8 is 16 in an array, or 5 times 8 is 40, because there's 40 one by one blocks in my array, that becomes really powerful. Because if I'm not a great memorizer, I start to learn that I can do harder math facts by combining my known math facts. And so I'm not holding anybody back, because the support I've been given from the beginning helps my memory. The other thing that's interesting about this is, again, the argument that you're slowing kids down by doing this, no, this connects to the distributive property. That's what the distributive property says. I can decompose my seven and distribute through the decomposed number to get back my eight times seven. Another example is once I get good at this idea of understanding what's underneath the multiplication fact, I can use these, this array model to do things that explain all kinds of things that we have to memorize. For instance, you all remember mem memorizing FOIL, first, outer, inner, last. Well, what does that connect to? Well, it connects to the idea of decomposing a number and looking at the partial products. So my 10 by 10 array gives me 100. My 2 by 10 array gives me 20. My 10 by 4 array is going to give me 40. And my final one, 2 by 4, is going to be 8 in the corner. If I do this at the whole number level and I take that time, I'm not slowing anybody down. What I'm doing is getting what's underneath. So all kids are staying on board. And what's really fun about this is that this is algebra. This prepares me for algebra better than if I just memorize those facts. Because look. You remember FOIL? First, outer, inner, last. Well, that's what I just did. So now when I see that at the symbolic level, with algebra, with X's and Y's, ah, oh, they're so hard. It's not that hard, because I understand the connections. I understand what they represent. It's the same exact idea. We have to teach what's underneath the math. This isn't slowing down. This is what the high-performing countries are doing. They're making connections. So am I a math person? I mean, I kind of sound like a math person. Let's take a look. Here is my 1979-1980 report card. Uh, I, I told you my mom was a teacher. Um, so we've got everything. And um, so I was a junior in high school, taking Algebra 2. 
ooh, well, D on the mid-semester. I had a real comeback. I ended up with a C. Um, I wasn't so good at chemistry either. I'm sure Mr. Summerhalter did not think I was a math person, okay? Uh, Algebra 2 was completely disconnected, you know, Soka Toa, you know, the Indian princess was supposed to help me with trigonometry. Um, you know, it was ridiculous to me. And, you know, I developed an absentee problem. And um, so, you know, I just thought it was the stupidest thing ever. It wasn't until I became a special educator teaching high school students that I thought, okay, nobody else wants to help kids with math. I'll do that. I passed Algebra 1. Um, and, uh, and so I started taking classes um, at the community college, and I had to reteach myself math in a way that I knew would connect to my students. And, um, oh, actually, I know this was 1979, but I did happen to find an old analog print of me and my friends studying for that midterm. So, um, so how did I get from here to where I am now? When I started to reteach myself math, I noticed different parts of my brain firing because I made sense of connections. So I would look and I'd say, oh, you mean, a square inch is really a square? Shoot, why didn't somebody tell me that? Okay, that would have been helpful to know, okay? And, and then it connects to exponents. Three squared, oh, you mean take a three and make a square out of it? Oh, I can do that. And then square roots, square roots literally means you have a nine that's the area of, a square that's the area of nine. Well, a square root means how long is one side? There's visuals. I can connect to my analog brain. I can see how full things are. Once you understand that, then you understand the Pythagorean theorem, which is like, you know, the key to the universe. Everything is the Pythagorean theorem, the distance formula, the quadratic formula, all that stuff you had to memorize is just the Pythagorean theorem, okay? And so the math started to come alive to me. That that's literally the A's square plus B's square equals C's square. This is about rug space. Okay, that's all the Pythagorean theorem is. And so now you can do anything. The symbols, there's something that lives underneath the symbols. The math comes alive. Literally, you start to feel different parts of your brain firing. So it becomes really exciting. Anybody can connect to math if we process through our brain. And what I've found, and what I've found that works with the students that I work with, from little kids up to 65-year-old uh, teachers, is that you've got to make these connections and you need conceptual repetitions, not symbolic repetitions, unless there's a, connect, a, a conceptual underpinning that's being practiced with each symbolic repetition. So here's my point. We cannot afford as a country to assume that half of us aren't math people. We're cutting our resources in half. We're tracking students. Our tracks end up reflecting our prejudices in our society, where some kids have access to to honors math and some kids don't. We can't put our resources and our policy into just trying to make those good math students be better. We have to approach math in a way that connects to everybody's brain. Thank you. <laughs>